Okay, gang, um, putting together this recording just to go over some of the uh, reflection theories that we covered in class. Um, I mentioned to you that uh, the digital projector wasn't working and I would put together a more extensive example beyond the stuff that I did just on the marker board. So this is basically a digital version of the same kind of lecture, just walking through each sort of different step from it. And right now it's just a blank screen, so let's dig right into it. Now, last term, uh, we talked about the basics in terms of perspective and construction and the ability uh, you know, to build consistent objects and volumes. Here is uh, you know, a, a simple rectangular shape. And the easiest way to find the center of this object is just to go from corner to corner, just like this. And then what you'll quite simply have in front of you is the center of that particular object. The same thing holds true in terms of perspective. If this is the same kind of rectangular shape in perspective and those um, you know, distance lines are moving towards vanishing points, you can still do the same trick corner to corner, take those central points back to the vanishing point, and you'll find the perspective center. So that gives you a very clear uh, and easy way just by going corner to corner on any kind of box or rectangular object, and you'll be able to get, um, you know, find the center of the object. In that exact same way, you can actually plot accurate reflections. It's one of those things that is way simpler than people realize, and it kind of drives me crazy sometimes because I'll see a lot of illustrations, even professional stuff, where if they just took a little bit of time and understood the basic theories I'm going to cover here, you could eyeball a pretty accurate reflection quite quickly and get something that looks really good. But a lot of times people will just go, well, there's a mirror there, so I'll have it reflect kind of whatever is vaguely in front of it, rather than understanding the way that a mirror works and how easy it is to be able to plot it with some accuracy uh, and make it work. In fact, if you understand this corner-to-corner -corner, uh, repetition um, theory that I'm covering here, you actually already have all the basic tools you need to do reflections on a flat kind of 90 degree surface. So look at this here in the bottom right. If this was our reflecting surface, you'll see the blue rectangle there acting as a mirror. Essentially, the reflection is the opposite of what is facing towards it in perspective, which means something like this letter, if it was on the floor in the mirror, would just be the continuation of that same object inverted heading back to the vanishing point. So once you can find center and once you can find those halfway points, it's actually really easy to do reflections. I'm going to go through a more extensive example here. All right. So here's a really basic room that I put together. It's a digital version of the exact same tutorial that I showed in class. Um, I put the vanishing points closer than I would normally. I talk uh, a lot about how on two-point perspective, if you put the vanishing points too close, you can get some distortion. And we have a little bit here, but I wanted to keep it as big as possible so that you can see the theories at play. Uh, just know that when you're doing your own room scenes, generally speaking, I find it helpful to pull those vanishing points out further. Here's the two main vanishing points for the scene. And what you'll see is all the lines on the wall that head towards the right side are moving towards that vanishing point and all the other lines to the left vanishing point. Well, not all of them. There is this rotated box right here as well. That one has its own set of vanishing points rotated from the previous ones. I'm going to show you how to plot reflections on that rotated surface as well, but let's do the basic ones first just to get you all settled in. So I'm going to remove these extra lines but I'm going to leave my vanishing points and my eye line. Okay, um, so we've got three different basic objects we're going to plot reflections on. First one is we've got the picture frame, and it's very, very simple in terms of its shape and in terms of how it's all laid out. If the reflecting surface that we're going to be using is this wall, um, it's almost like one of those ballet studios where the entire wall is going to be a mirror. 
just so that we can plot as much reflective material as possible and show you kind of all the theories at play here. So this entire right hand wall is going to act as our mirror. It's going to reflect everything in the room and show us all kinds of uh, information in the reversal. So we've got the picture frame here. And the first thing to understand is that uh, although the picture frame is going to be reflected in the mirror, it's going to be reflected a little ways in because of this gap. This gap between the wall and the picture needs to also be plotted in the reflection. How do we do that? Well, the first thing to understand is that there is shape, as in the picture frame itself, but then there's negative shape. There's the space between the mirror and the reflecting surface, and it's also a shape. So if I want to visualize that, for example, the dark green is the actual picture. The light green is the negative shape of the space between the picture and the wall. Once you understand that and you can visualize it, it becomes very easy to plot those reflections. Let me show you what I mean. So first things first, I'm going to take away my color. So what you see is now I'm doing corner to corner on, and I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it better, the negative shape and I'm taking those vanishing, uh, those lines back to the vanishing point here on the right hand side. So now I can find the center of that particular shape, take it back to the vanishing point, and now I've got the halfway point for my reflection. So again, let me zoom in, I'll show this to you a little bit more clearly. So I've got the midway point. <clears throat> now what I can do is I can trace a line from the top of this corner through the halfway point, which becomes the new halfway point for the reflected line. And there is the front edge of the picture frame reflected on, properly based on the mirror. Make sense? All right, so I have that one edge figured out, but I still have to figure out where the back of the picture is going to go. Let me remove these lines just to keep it nice and simple. Zoom back in and I'll show you how we find the second set. So the same theory is at play. Now though, what we're going to do is we're going to find the entire shape. So we're going to use the shape of both squares put together as one larger rectangle that we're going to be plotting. So we've got the, our main lines heading back to the vanishing point. Now we find the center line of the larger rectangle. It's actually the same center line, but just for simplicity's sake. Carry that back to the vanishing point because it's a receding line. Carry that line through the new center and where it hits the bottom or the top, you could go either way is where the back line of the picture is going to go, like that. So if we put both those lines together, what we get is the limitations. We have the gap, and then we have the actual space of the picture. Let me remove the lines, and I'll show you how that looks. So we have the shape. We've got the reflection of the shape in the mirror. Make sense? Not that I'm expecting you to answer, it is a YouTube video. All right. So there's what the picture looks like in the reflection. Bam. So we've plotted the one picture in the reflection. It's all clear there and it makes sense. All right. I'm going to remove this for now just so that we can focus on each individual object and not get caught up in all the lines that are flying around. If you find this difficult or you find you have too many lines on the page, this is where having an overlay using your light table can spare your eyes from trying to discern which line corresponds to which object as you're building it. All right, moving right along. Let's do the door. So it's the exact same theory with the door. It's just further back. So here we have the shape of the door and then we have the negative shape created by the rectangle gap of the door to the reflecting surface, okay? The further back it is, of course, the further back it's gonna be in the reflection. So we're gonna follow the exact same theories and plot out the door, just like this. 
So we take those lines back to the vanishing point because it's receding on that particular plane. We find the halfway point of the gap and it's not the same as the eye line. It's close, but it's not the same and accuracy is important. We're going to carry that center line through, go through the new middle and where it touches on the bottom, that's going to be the reflected front edge of the door. Just like that. Get rid of those extra lines. Do it again. Oh, there we go. Now we're going to do the entire shape of the rectangle of the door and the gap as if it's all one shape put together. So both the brown and the yellow here as one rectangular shape. We find the halfway point. It's going to be the same because it's heading to the same vanishing point. Carry through that center line. Cross through the middle. And we get our new line to show the reflection of the shape of the door. How does that look all put together? It's going to look like this. So that's the reflection of the door in the mirror. We've got the main shape here and the negative shape of the gap. And then we've got the reflection of the gap and the reflection of the door all put together properly plotted to the vanishing point. All right. Two down, we've got one to go. We're going to do the table. Now the table is a more three-dimensional object. These are essentially mostly two-dimensional. I mean, there's a bit of depth on the door frame that's pretty easy to, to drop in there. But the actual table has more depth, so it's going to be a bit more complicated as we go. First thing to keep in mind is, what is the volume? What is the footprint of that table? When we were talking about perspective in the very first class that I taught, we went on about how important that was to understand volume. You're not just looking at the surface of an object or the outer shape, you're understanding it as a volume, as a form that takes up space within this environment. So here, again, we have um, a shape now that we can plot and a gap so we understand what the distance is between the table legs and the reflecting surface. Here's what it looks like. So the red shape is the footprint of the table. The orange shape is the gap between the table and the reflecting surface. And we need to know what both of them are in order to accurately plot the reflection. How does that look? Well, let me show you. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So again, we're going to plot out the gap as its own shape. Find that middle line. Go through the center where it touches on the other side, then because it's a receding line, you need to take that back to the other vanishing point, just like this. Let me show you the full size here. Take that back to the vanishing point here. And what you end up with, there's the where the bottom of the table is going to start, basically the position of these two table legs in perspective. Make sense? Okay, so now we can do the same thing. Just going to remove some of these excess lines so it doesn't get too busy. All right, so we're going to do the same thing now with the entire rectangle. I don't need to find the middle because the middle is the same, each one. So I can take here from the bottom corner, go through the center here, where it touches on the other side, that's going to then get carried back to the vanishing point. And then that line is essentially representing the footprint of the table as a whole. Okay, so now I've got quite a bit of information here. I know exactly where the footprint of the table is. So I have a space that I can build from. I'm going to get rid of the excess lines here. Here's what that looks like. So now we need to construct the rest of the table. It's not as difficult as you might think. What we can do here is we've got that square. I'm just going to remove my excess lines. There we go. So there's the footprint of the table in perspective. If we carry these lines up vertically, we now have a volume. But what we don't know is where those volumes stop. How does that correspond to the table? Well, it's actually really easy. All we have to do is take 
the top of the table and trace it back to the vanishing point. Oop, wrong line. Here we go. There we go. So we take those two top edges of the vanishing point. Uh, sorry, I'll say that again. So we take these uh, top points for the table and where they cross the corresponding part of the table in the reflection, that's where it touches and that's going to create the box for the rest of the table, just like this. Those get carried back to the vanishing point and then you construct the table from there. So here's how that looks once you've taken away all the excess. So now we have the table in the reflection. We've got the door in the reflection. And we've got the picture frame in the reflection. Quite a bit of information for us to work with here. <clears throat> the other thing that we have, just to give you a sense of it, is the, the walls themselves are going to be, of course, reflected as well. So we need to have those go back to the vanishing point. And you'll see it continues on right to the vanishing point. What we don't know right now is actually what's past this point. In the mirror, we can see more information about the room than we have here in the actual room itself. Because the mirror is reflecting the back wall, even though the back wall here is technically behind us based on perspective. So this gives us a way to actually show more information than we had before. So if we wanted to construct a wall, for example, we could put it anywhere because there's no one, there's no information showing us where that wall needs to go. But we could put it, say, here, take it to that vanishing point, strike that point vertically, and then what we end up with is something like this. So now I've got the reflection of the rest of the room, even though we can't see it in the regular room. Pull back a bit and you can see the whole thing now. So the only object we still have to reflect is this rotated box. And it's complicated. I can't lie. It uh, is a bit of a time consuming process to get it accurate, but I'm going to show you how that works. Oh, one more thing. Because we've got this back wall, again, we can give you more information. So I could put all kinds of stuff here. We could put, you know, other windows, other doors. There could be stairs. There could be a storefront or all kinds of different things that would now get added, you know, to the layout and give you more information about this scene thanks to the reflection in the mirror. All right. Let's get rid of all that excess stuff, all the extra walls and all the uh, extra materials so we can just focus on the rotated box show you how that works make sure that you are confident so we need to figure out how that rotation works and i know that your first thought might be well that's okay we'll just find the vanishing point for that particular rotated box and then we can go from there uh, sort of but it's not quite what you think it is so yes we are going to find that vanishing point for the box we don't need the other one this time. Um, but the reason why we find those points is to get the footprint of that box. What we need are these four points. Let me get a little bit closer. These four points on the corners. That's what we need to know. Those are going to be waypoints that we're going to plot in the reflection. How does that work? I'm going to show you. So. The first thing you need to know, I'm just going to get rid of, again, excess lines, trying to cut down as much as possible on those excess lines. So we've got oh, our four points in space. <clears throat> now what we need to do is we need to trace those to the two vanishing points like this. So all four of those points that correspond to the footprint, we trace through to this vanishing point. And then we trace through to the left vanishing point as well. What does that give us? That gives us a series of rectangles. Because what we're measuring is how close is this corner, the bottom corner of the footprint of the object. Remember, this isn't the top of the box. This is the footprint of the box, right? 
how far is that from the reflecting surface? How far is this corner from the reflecting surface? How far is this bottom corner and this bottom corner? All from the reflecting surface. Knowing that is going to allow us to create a series of rectangles that we can then plot on the same pathway into the reflection. It sounds a little bit confusing, but I'm going to walk you through it. So here's an example of one of these rectangles. We're going to find this particular point. And I could use any set of rectangles as long as this corner corresponds to one of the corners of the rectangle. I chose a bigger shape because it tends to be easier to be accurate when you're finding those halves and when you're plotting through. If I did a really small and thin one, there's more room for mistakes to get you know, into the process. So now I've got, I'm going to take away all the excess lines so we can focus just on what's important. Here we go. So this is the rectangle for this particular waypoint on the ground. And all we're going to worry about is getting that rectangle correct. So we find the halfway point. We go back to the vanishing point and then trace through just like we did before. We just jumped ahead a little bit. This is the halfway point. This is carrying through that point. And now we know where this point is reflecting that point. Boom. So we've got a dot there on the ground we're going to mark it with. I'm going to get rid of the excess lines. <clears throat> we have that point plotted in space. Now we're going to do the same thing here. Now we have another rectangle. This rectangle is going to correspond to this particular waypoint on the ground. All we're worried about is this orange rectangle and finding the position of this dot in the reflection. Don't worry about all the excess lines. Don't get mixed up with them because it can get very confusing. I'm going to take away all that excess. Just focus on the rectangle itself. This is all I'm worried about. Find the midway point. Go through the center. Use that half and plot it through. What do we end up with? Another red dot on the ground. Now we have two surfaces plotted out. We have this one and this one. Get rid of the excess so you're not getting confused with all the extra information. Now we've got another rectangle. What does this one correspond to? Let me show you. So this one is going to help us find this particular waypoint for the reflected rotated object. Get rid of the excess lines. Just focus on this rectangle. Don't worry about the excess. <clears throat> Find the halfway point, spear it through the middle, carry that line through. And that gives us our third out of four points. It's a bit of a time consuming process, but it's going to be really accurate and it's going to look real good. All right, we're almost there. One more. You're like, man, I am not doing any rotated objects. It looks really good if you can pull it off. So I do recommend that, you know, if you can put them in there and make them look good. It is a nice, nice effect to have. All right, now we've got this smaller rectangle. We just need that front corner. We have three out of the four ready to go. So get rid of the excess lines. And what you'll see is, again, same kind of deal. Find the halfway point, go through the middle, plot that final dot, drop it down, Get rid of all the extra stuff. Now we have four dots plotted out in space. And what you'll see is all four of those line up to those lines in the reflection, just like they should. It was just a matter of figuring out where they were that we needed. All right. So we've got the four dots, which means now we have the bottom square. But again, we need to figure out how high it goes up. It's the same theory, just like with the box, or just like with the table. So we've got vertical lines. We're plotting in space. I'm going to pull the screen back so you can see it here. Let me zoom in this way. There we go. Just want to get that vanishing point in there so you can see it. <clears throat> 
then we're going to carry these lines over and what you'll see is this top corner where it touches that same reverse top corner that's where it's going to correspond this one here corresponds to that one there this side there on there and then this one in the bottom left is the top back so how it looks is there because that's where each point is touching on the top draw that all up get rid of the excess stuff bam get rid of the excess dots that we use to plot the ground and what you get is the reflected box in the mirror so now we got a lot of information here we've got the table reflection we've got the door reflection we've got the picture frame and we also built our back walls so we've got the walls we got the little furnishing back there it's a pretty extensive um, reflection it's quite well built but we're not quite done yet now you're thinking to yourself well that all works fine if I have you know the ballet studio with an entire wall that's a mirror but what if I just have a small mirror what if it's just a rectangle well this is the thing and the reason why you want to plot this stuff out the minute you have this full reflection you can do any mirror that's hanging on this wall as long as the mirror is flush to the wall in 90 degrees it's going to be very simple if this is the square shape of the mirror this is what you're going to see from this angle that's the reflection no matter what size it is the same thing holds true if it's a circular mirror hanging right here. You're just going to see that part of the door because this, the mirror angle and perspective determines what reflects in it, not the shape of the mirror. It doesn't matter if you have a dozen little tiny mirrors hanging on the wall. If this is where the position is and this is where you're standing, that's what's going to be reflected in it. The same thing holds true even if you got one of those weird wavy ikea mirrors as long as it's not convex or concave if it's a flat mirror and it's hanging on this surface that's what it's going to reflect make sense okay so we're almost done a couple other little tricks and things i want to show you we've covered quite a bit of uh, good material one more little thing here get rid of my little mirror shapes let's say you have a really fancy crazy place and you've got reflections on the floor how do you do that well it's actually way easier than even doing the stuff in the mirror the reason why we have so much work to do is because we have the z-axis we have depth in this particular reflection for things that are reflecting in the floor or if we were reflecting in the ceiling it's actually much simpler because all you need to do is figure out a repetition of the same distance so if I want to reflect this table into the floor, all I have to do is take this vertical measurement, double it, and then I'm going to carry those back to the vanishing point, just like this. So I've got same thing here. I did it with the door, did it with the door handle. Whatever this distance is, I just double it and then plot it back to the vanishing point. And what you end up with is a really simple set of reflections here. So the table is now reflected in our mirror floor. The window, uh, sorry, the picture frame is reflected in the mirror floor. And the door is reflected in the mirror floor. And it all just goes back to the same vanishing points. Neat stuff, right? But remember, just like how we can see more information about the room here on the back wall, we can see more information about the room in this table because here we're looking at the top of the table right we see the top of the table here but this reflection of the table is actually the bottom of the table so we're finding out stuff that's whatever's on the bottom of the table it's probably not going to be very interesting it's the bottom of a table there's probably going to be like i don't know gum jam there or someone carved their name in the bottom but in terms of accuracy that's what you're actually going to see all kinds of different stuff if you want to get super fancy there would technically also be reflection of the reflection here all this stuff would get reflected in the bottom if you had a mirror floor 
We're getting a little bit crazy now, but that's how that stuff all works. Once you've figured out the basics, you can start plotting reflections pretty much anywhere. Now there are more complex reflections. If you have mirrors that are on a tilt, it's going to rotate that reflection. If you if it's tilted, you know, sideways, then it's going to rotate the vanishing points an equivalent angle. If you tilt the mirror up or down, it's going to alter the eye line up or down a proportionate amount. And that's a lot more complex and generally not something you're going to use like 95% of the time in in any kind of reflection drawing. I, I hearken to say you'd almost never ever use tilted mirrors in your average drawing. But even this, this basic skill with the repeat, you know, the repeating shapes and finding the center, that is more than most people do. And if you do it well, people are going to be really impressed. They're going to understand that you've gone to that trouble and it looks accurate. It feels accurate. They might not even know how difficult it was for you to put together, <clears throat> but the end result will feel very solid and consistent. And that's what you're going for with your drawings. So as you work away on your current assignment, make sure it's got a prominent mirror. Make sure you're plotting it you know, accurately. And uh, make sure you've got something interesting to see in that mirror. Make sure it's enhancing your storytelling as much as possible. Otherwise, best of luck with your assignment. And let me know if you're having any trouble.